Fantastic. It is an enormous pleasure to be here today, an enormous honor to be with you in what is the hottest spot for tech and health innovation in America as of this moment, Lafayette, Louisiana, Silicon Bayou. It is a delight to be here. Congratulations to everything that you've got going on. Um, and uh, just, a bit of, just a bit of background about me. Um, so uh, actually, I spent my, really, my whole professional life as an entrepreneur in the private sector. Uh, I co-founded a company called Athena Health, which built the first web-based software for doctor's offices. Uh, took it public about 10 years later, and then to stay married, I retired, uh, moved to California near my mother and father-in-law. Uh, we had a baby. Uh, my wife was very, very happy for the first time ever, really. Uh, and it was hard to stay retired, so I actually funded and started two more companies, one called Castlight Health that aims to help consumers uh, uh, see the cost and quality of healthcare service before they actually go so they can shop for it just like they shop for everything else, make decisions right for them. A company called HealthPoint Services in uh, India that brings affordable telehealth, uh, clean uh, water, drugs and diagnostics to the rural poor. Um, and then I got this email, uh, basically out of the blue. I'd done some help actually um, at a think tank advising on uh, health IT and healthcare transformation uh, in DC on a volunteer basis. I got this email from the US Department of Health and Human Services. They said, we'd like you to, to become our CTO, or at least think about it. And my immediate response was, why in the heck are you calling me? Because I don't know anything about government. And they said, that is exactly why we're calling you, because we know a lot about government, but this position is not what you think it is. It's not the guy who has to run all IT at HHS. It's the internal change agent who's supposed to work with our best innovators to dream up and then execute at high speed projects that can help HHS unleash the power of data, IT, and innovation to improve the health of the American people. We want a technology entrepreneur in residence, they said. At which point I said, what? <laughs> and then I talked to them about it in more detail. They were completely serious. So I went back to my wife in California and said, this is a possibility. She was furious. She was so incredibly angry at me. She almost divorced me on the spot. And then four days later, she said, you know what? If HHS is really creating a tech entrepreneur residence job, it is your national duty to do that job. And I will move back to the East Coast, which I hate, with you, with our baby, and lose you to workaholic them again, because you've just got to do this for the country. And so because of her, I moved back to DC and uh, became the CTO of HHS and have recently become CTO of the White House. And it sounds completely strange. The most entrepreneurial experience I've ever had in my life has been serving in the United States government. It's absolutely counterintuitive and incredible. And it's because what's basically happened is I've been allowed to be an entrepreneur. So I come up with an idea, and what I've learned is, this is the trick, right? When I come up with an idea, I go find the three to five people that actually had that idea a long time ago, right? And I recruit them into my team and say, look, I'll give you the air cover to do what you've always wanted to do, right? I'll block down field for you, take arrows for you, and make sure that you can get done what you want to get to do. And then, basically, you just unleash them to do these amazing things at incredible speed. And one of the initiatives I want to talk a bit more about today uh, that's made this experience so incredible, not real, is something called the Health Data Initiative, which is a project that we launched at HHS uh, about uh, two, two and a half years ago and that I'm continuing to champion as White House CTO. And the whole notion of the Health Data Initiative is basically data liberation. Liberation. And basically, it, it's an attempt to essentially, it's an effort to emulate what the government actually did in the past with weather data, for example. So there's this amazing little agency in the US government called NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that collects virtually all weather data in America. It's, it's not like your local newscaster measures barometric pressure himself every morning, right? Gets the data from NOAA. But for about 35 years now, NOAA's done something even more interesting than that, which is it's actually made all this weather data it collects electronically available in machine-readable form, downloadable by anybody for free without intellectual property constraint. That has then fed a massive rising tide of entrepreneurship in the private sector that's created the Weather Channel, weather.com, iPhone weather apps, weather insurance, creating billions of dollars in value for the American economy thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs and made our lives better in so many ways it's hard to keep track. Government ran a similar play in the 1980s when President Reagan liberated global positioning system data, GPS, which of course now powers everything from Foursquare and our iPhone to precision crop farming to super tanker navigation systems and everything in between, right? All of which were built at no cost to the taxpayer. The government just liberated data and private sector entrepreneurs then turned that data into awesomeness. That again, helps us in so many ways it's hard to keep track and creates jobs and economic growth. So we said, that's awesome. Why don't we do that again? This time with health-related data sitting in the vaults of HHS. If you're a data enthusiast, if you care about healthcare, HHS data stores, it's like walking through a candy store. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. If you look at NIH, Medicare, the CDC, FDA, 
unbelievable amounts of data sitting in the vaults of government that can create so much value, but which are really massively underutilized today, used by only a very narrow band of people. So our idea with the Health Data Initiative was to change that equation, to liberate the data and put it in the hands of American entrepreneurs who could turn it into awesomeness, turn it into products, services, features, programs, insights that can improve health and healthcare and create jobs at the same time. So what we've done is actually three things. One is we've taken a whole bunch of data and made it available for the first time. Secondly, even more importantly maybe, maybe less sexily, but equally importantly I would say, we're actually taking a bunch of data that was already public, but was in the form of PDFs and books and static websites, and turned into forms that developers can actually use. Machine readable data that you can actually download, that you can access through application program interfaces. In other words, data in a form that developers can ingest into third party products and services and applications to turn into magic for the American people. And then finally, maybe most surprisingly, but maybe in retrospect not surprising at all, um, we realized pretty early on that 95% uh, plus of entrepreneurs that could actually take this data and turn it into products didn't even know what the US Department of Health and Human Services does, let alone the fact that we had this data, right? Let alone the fact that we're making it available to them. So we actually engaged in a very counterintuitive, uh, according to many people in government, but ultimately incredibly successful campaign through meetups, and codathons and challenges and festivals to publicize this data to entrepreneurs so they can actually scrub into it and turn it into incredible stuff. And the data we've been releasing, the entrepreneurs have been using, is everything from Medicare claims in a variety of different formats, community health performance statistics, like relative rates of obesity and drivers of obesity, uh, smoking and, and drivers of health status, health system performance in communities across the country, uh, directories of where all the healthcare providers are, where all the human service providers are, where all the farmers markets are, where all kinds of services are, detailed information about the quality of healthcare providers and how they perform uh, versus each other, the latest and greatest medical knowledge from the National Library of Medicine, patient education information turned into machine readable data that can be broadcast into whatever applications might consume it, product data about drugs, product data about food, product data about insurance, making it all available, machine readable, downloadable, accessible via APIs, and promoting it to developers who can turn it into, into magic. And what we have witnessed is incredible, incredible. So the best way for me to describe it is actually through, through stories. So the story I want to focus on actually, maybe for the time being, is the story of our health data pollutes. Have you heard about these? Health data pollutes? Do you ever think someone from the US government would say the word data pollutes? Little make it a primary feature of government policy. Well, a primary feature of our policy has been the concept of data pollutes. Well, what is a data pollutes, you might ask? Well, it's a, it's a festival of awesomeness on an epic scale, it's the only way to describe it. But really, uh, more precisely, what we do is, in partnership with uh, private sector organizations and foundations, universities, we host these festivals where uh, we invite anybody in America or around the globe who's taken our data and used it as fuel for a new product or service or feature that helps consumers, doctors, employers, communities improve health and health care, they're invited to give a brief TED-style talk, if you will, uh, on their innovation. To qualify for the festival, you A, have to have built something that's adding concrete value to the life of a patient, consumer, doctor, nurse, employer, journalist, community, et cetera, that helps improve health and care. Secondly, you have to have a sustainable business model. Because we're not interested in showcasing stuff that's purely uh, theoretical, but only stuff that actually can be delivered to real people in the real world today. So last year, we did our 2011 health data pollutes, and we had a little problem, which is we were overwhelmed with the number of people who had already built services and products that actually met our criteria. So we called an audible and ended up doing an American Idol-style bake-off process where innovators would present via WebEx to panels of consumers and doctors and nurses and others who would score them. And uh, what, what we tell people is that actually I, I was not a judge, but I was an observer, uh, and people started calling me Paula Abdul which I didn't fully understand because I don't watch American Idol, but apparently Paula Abdul, if she's the one who's always incredibly excited and weeps constantly in joy and gets angry at the other judges because the judges are being mean to the consensus. That was me. That was me. I said, how can you not let this innovator in? He's worked so hard. He's so talented. I know it's a little rough, but it's fantastic. Shut up, Todd, is what the judges said. Um, and thank goodness because they had to narrow it down. And they narrowed it down to 50 amazing products and innovations that were showcased at the June 2011 Health Data Palooza. Uh, the video is actually on the Institute of Medicine's website, also Health2.0's website. And one of the things we like to say is that if your faith in America right now is wavering even a smidgen, even just a little bit, go to the Institute of Medicine's website 
and watch as many of these 50 videos of these 50 amazing entrepreneurs as you can because it is the most awe-inspiring display of American mojo I've ever seen. And I can't possibly do justice to it as much as I'd like to with my hand gestures, um, but to just check out the video. I mean, it's everything from solutions that help consumers make the right decisions for them by putting the right information at their fingertips about the food that they may be eating or the, the products they may be actually using or the healthcare providers that they should choose for their family or clinical trials they could find to help save their lives. One of the interesting things actually about these consumer apps is that increasingly, right, one, one, one long-time health entrepreneur said to me, you know what, it turns out telling people to eat their spinach or else doesn't tend to work so well. We've been trying it really hard, it doesn't seem to work. So how about we make it fun? Right? So you actually are seeing innovators leverage social networking, gaming, and other things people find fun, but to help them actually adapt and evolve to get healthier, which is brilliant and amazing. Brilliant and amazing. We're really, really close to happening in this regard. A whole set of products and services that help doctors and hospitals deliver ever better, ever, ever safer, ever more effective care. Optimizing health outcomes, not just care outcomes, but health outcomes, helping proactively manage chronic disease using the power of data and patient engagement, helping uh, medical homes, calendar care organizations, these new delivery systems focused on health maximization succeed. Uh, all kinds of new tools and services that help journalists, for example, identify key issues in their community and write about them, like disparities in health outcomes by, by gender or race ethnicity, and, and publicize those and mobilize action like only journalists can or tools that help a county commissioner or a public health official, incredibly low cost, get situational awareness about where all the, the food deserts are, right? The areas in your community where if you live in that community, you can't get access to healthy food for your family, right? And maybe that changes policy. Maybe that helps you figure out what the zoning laws should be, what you should do to help attract food oases to, to live in those food deserts, to actually change people's lives in all kinds of ways. This is just incredible stuff. And the best part from my standpoint was that HHS built none of these things. The number of taxpayer dollars expended building these things Bupkis, cero, nada. All we did was take data you've already paid for, jujitsu it into the public domain, made it machine readable, right? Let people know it was there, and then you did the rest. American entrepreneurs did the rest. Building services and products and new features with a ferocity and a velocity that just stuns. Stuns. And it's just continuing to go. It's continuing to go. So we're actually now we're, we're in the process of preparing for our 2012 health data palooza which is gonna be in DC at the Washington Convention Center, the only space large enough to hold all the awesomeness that's happening. Um, this year, 230 companies have thrown their hat in the ring. They're going through the American Idol process right now to present at Datapalooza. One of the best parts about this is I was reviewing the, the submissions of each of the 230. Again, just Paul Abdul, I'm not judging, I'm just interested, right? I'm just a fan. And one of the most interesting data points was the, the founding dates of the companies. 2010, 2010, 2011, 2011, 2011, 2011, 2012! 2012, I said, that's awesome. You have the hot spot to actually enter the pollutes. So good for you, good for you, right? All kinds of new companies by brave new entrepreneurs. I had, you know, I, 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 I talk around the country about this. I try to recruit innovators on behalf of America, right, to jump into healthcare and use health data. I had not heard of, heard of 90% of the entrants. I said, who are you? This is awesome. This is completely out of control. And the best part to me, the best part to me is events like this, right? Because basically, <laughs> you came out of nowhere, as far as I'm concerned, right? I mean, I love Bruce. I came down to hang out with Bruce and his team. There's so much awesomeness happening, by the way, here in Louisiana. It's a real model for the country in so many respects, including this one, but many other respects as well. Uh, I talked about health data liberacion, right? Zach started saying liberacion. Ramesh, like God, and said, we're going to do a code fest in Lafayette. I said, that's fantastic, right? I wasn't sure what happened next. Next thing I know, Ramesh calls and says, there are 300 people convening in Lafayette with the support of the entire community and an arsenal of companies with huge amounts of data, not just from HHS, but from the state and other sources, to focus in an epic code fest on building solutions that can help contribute to the fight against child obesity. I said, what? <laughs> this is fantastic. This is fantastic. And this is why I'm so optimistic about America right now, why I'm so optimistic about our fight to solve our biggest challenges. Because if there's, there's, there's only one thing I really learned as a private sector entrepreneur. And so I, I, had, I had some success as a private sector entrepreneur. My company, Athena Health, went public for a billion dollars. It's now worth 2.7 billion. Of course, I've divested. When you join the US government, you have to sell everything. You can't own anything, anything anymore. So I'm fully divested. Um, Castlight Health was actually, uh, the second company I co-founded was named by the Wall Street Journal as the number one venture backed company in America, uh, 2011. Uh, health Point Services Company India was named by India as the top social innovation in the health space uh, last year. 
Actually, both HealthPoint and Athena Health were named by MIT recently as two of the top 50 most innovative companies in the world. And there is one reason why that's true, why all that success happened. It's not me, okay? It's definitely not me. It's that I understood one rule, which is the following. If you get the best people, you win. If you don't, it becomes much more difficult, <laughs> right? The same thing is true of ecosystems. The same thing is true of ecosystems. If we can attract the best people on the planet to help us solve our problems, there is no problem America can't invent its way out of. No problem we can't invent our way out of. And that is what I'm so excited about, because this represents that principle in action. We are attracting the best people in the world to care about the problem of child obesity and come up with some breakthrough, some beginning of a breakthrough that can make a big difference in the fight. And beyond whatever you invent today, I hope you just get addicted to this problem. Get addicted to this problem and turn it into your life's work. And this is one final inspiration story, just to show you actually what can happen. So we did a code-a-thon with Health 2.0 and Academy Health and Georgetown University in D.C. Uh, 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 on, uh, uh, it was actually, uh, and really any topic, it was an open health data code-a-thon, uh, February of last year. We said, anyone who's interested in health data, learn more about health data, building stuff with health data, you're welcome to show up. I was terrified, actually, because, you know, D.C. is in Silicon Valley. It was going to be on a Saturday at Georgetown in February, starting at 9.30. I was thinking to myself, well, who's going to show up? Like, developers normally don't get up until noon, right? Who's going to actually show up? Like, thank God all you guys showed up. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And 150 people showed up. I don't know how the hell this happened, right? <laughs> Including five kids from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I don't know how the heck they heard about this, but they, they heard about the code of thought about health data at Georgetown in D.C., and they got inspired. They bought these lab coats with matching insignia. It's a Team Maya, that's what they call themselves, right? They ran in the van, got up at Odark 100, and started driving to make it in time for it. They made it in time for the 9.30 kickoff of this Georgetown Health Data Hackathon. They knew nothing about health and healthcare, nothing. But they just wanted to make a difference. So uh, they scrubbed into the data, and they learned about this phenomenon called food deserts, right? Which, if you look at USDA data, you can see big swaths of America, uh, where if you live in that area, you do not have access to affordable, healthy food. I don't care how good the doctors are in that area. I don't care how good the hospitals are in the area. That area is going to have a lot of problems when it comes to health. There are entire public health symposia about food deserts. There's endless academic literature about this problem. These kids had not read any of that. They had not gotten the memo about what's impossible yet. So they decided to solve the food desert problem in eight hours. And what they did is they built this, built this brilliant app, had the idea, built the app in eight hours called Food Oasis, a brilliant mashup of text messaging farmers markets. So it turns out that virtually every American, including most Americans in low-income neighborhoods, have access to text messaging. So what they did was they said, okay, you can use the Food Oasis app via text messaging to text in the fact that you want to buy five zucchini and ten tomatoes. That goes to a central website. Your neighbors can do the same. Then a network of food suppliers, food co-ops, farmers markets look at the website and circle the orders you want to fulfill and hit fulfill and text everyone back and says, I will show up at St. John's Church from 1 to 5 p.m. this Saturday with your food. Kind of like a flash farmer's market, right, on a regular basis. Now, I don't know anything about the food business, but apparently if you don't need a store in the neighborhood, if you know demand entirely in advance, and if within four hours of showing up your entire inventory gets bought, the cost of food tends to drop. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah? Yeah. So basically, this won the code thon They've been iterating, 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 right? And actually, it turns out that while these kids don't know anything about health and healthcare, they're experts in something called supply chain management and consumer experience design, right? Maya is a IDEO-like company that does this kind of work in the Midwest. I went to visit their headquarters. The kids have an entire room. It's one giant whiteboard where they've mapped out in detail how they're going to systematically pressure test each component of their service and refine it until it actually works. They've actually now announced a major investment from a major American company to turn into a company they're going to beta test in seven American cities, and they're going to rock and roll. Amazing. So I hope that a story like that emerges from today. And just to actually call an audible, <laughs> uh, to add to the prizes, whichever team actually uh, wins the challenge, if you can turn it into a company here in America that helps contribute to the fight against child obesity and creates jobs, I will invite you to the White House for dinner or lunch or breakfast at the White House mess on me. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'd just love to see that happen. We'd love to see that happen. 
So as you engage in this work, I can't wait for you to start coding. I can't wait. I can't wait. Right? Oh, one thing for the developers, by the way, just, just, just a hint. One of the things we actually learned empirically based on data, because I love data, right? People that tend to win these things are people that tend to mash up people from different sectors, okay? It's not like the hacker working by him or herself. It's not the doctor working by him or herself. It's not the obesity expert working by him or herself. It's the mashup of the Silicon Valley renegade hacker, right? The doctor who's been actually working with patients with this issue for years, the obesity expert who mashed themselves up, who don't tend to hang out together. That's like the best part about these kinds of gatherings is they mash people up. It's people mashups. They create ingenious solutions, right? They're neither naive, right, and neither stuck in the conventional wisdom. So, Tap into the expertise of your fellow person as much as you possibly can, right? Recognize the truth of Joy's Law, right? Which is that Joy's Law, Bill Joy once said, founder of some systems, no matter who you are, you have to remember that most of the smartest people in the world work for somebody else, right? Which is, of course, true. Take advantage of that, harness that to build your solution. I look forward to taking that winning mashup team to the White House for lunch uh, or breakfast. And as you do this incredibly important work, this incredibly important work for which we're all so grateful, May the force be with you today and tomorrow. God bless you. God bless Lafayette, Louisiana, and the United States of America. Good luck. Thank you so much.